Welcome to Season 7, Episode 11 of the Ubuntu Podcast. It's Wednesday the 11th of June and we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news and in the Ubuntu community. If you're listening live, you can send us messages using the chat thing on the website and in the hash R-U-U-P-C-I-R-C channel. Why did I say hash? I never say hash. I'm Alan and joining me this week is Tony. Hello, Tony. Good evening, Alan. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad at all. Good. Good, good. All the better for seeing you and your beard. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Mark, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Good. Have you enjoyed that cake? Yes, it was uh, very gingery Good. and Jamaican. And you finished it. You're not going to eat it during the show, I've are you? I've got a few crumbs. Got oh. some crumbs there. We can also... Ah, that's Laura. Hello, Laura. Hello. How are you? Fine, thank you. Yummy cake. You didn't make it, did you? Not so, not this time, sadly. Ah, no. Okay, cool. Still yummy. <laughs> Uh, should we just get on with it? Yeah, why not? Sounds Let's like a compact show. And now it's time for the news. Version 1.0 of Docker, the portable virtualization container platform thing, has been released. <laughs> you sounded so credible until you said thing. <laughs> well, I sort of, I, I made up those words because they were the best way I could think of describing it. What is it then? It's sort of like, you know, like Linux containers. Yes, LXC. Uh, LX, yeah, so that gives you like a, not actually a virtual machine, but like a container <laughs> yeah. on your system so that you can run another you know, like a, a, a virtual application inside it inside containerized your... yes, yes exactly so docker is like that but then makes those portable between systems more easily so you can have docker you can have a server running docker and another server running docker and you can have a container and you can take it from one to another quite easily which is good if you're doing like cloud deployments and scaling up and things you and know all that modern jazz that the kids like to do and they've got a hosting repository haven't they where you can yes, put them in yeah share it. exactly so once you've once you've containerized an application then you can uh, you can like get them make it this. available to other people yes. so they can yes. deploy whatever your application is inside docker and so it's a hit 1.0 is that significant well that um they they basically said that's their sort of um milestone for api stability so it means that you know future releases are going to be backwards compatible with what works with 1.0 and is this something vaguely interesting to people who have linux on their laptop at home or or is this really just for devops and cloudy people i think it's both really because it's sort of it's the um, i think the idea is that you could start it at, ooh, start it as at a sort of single machine scale and then um you can sort of uh, scale know, out scale out you i really hate this terminology but you know <laughs> Uh, scale out your deployment to, you know, server farms, clouds, etc. Huh. Um, and Google seem to like it as well. They've said that they're going to uh, integrate it with Google App Engine and Google P Compute Engine, which are their sort of cloud platform as a service things. So I could, in theory, uh, develop my web app, whatever it might be, um, on my local machine, not not having any account with anyone anywhere, using Docker on my local, like, Ubuntu LTS box do all my development offline and then at the point when i want to test that out i could deploy it to a cloud of choice and that could be google app engine uh i that that's my understanding yes yeah huh i think you you don't have to use their repository you can create your own uh. <laughs> i'm still no clearer on any of that oh bless well, don't worry. We've got some gaming news coming up later, Tony, so you can uh, ah, show off your knowledge. My time to shine. In, uh, in that realm. Yes. Good stuff. Moving on in security news, another Ooh. serious security flaw has been found in OpenSSL. It's like every episode so far this well, season. Well, now, now they're actually auditing the code. They're finding lots of problems. <laughs> now someone's actually looking at Shock it. Shock horror. Yes. So the floor allows attackers to force OpenSSL to use a weaker cipher in its encryption algorithm. So OpenSSL supports multiple cipher algorithms, and you can force it to use a weaker one that yes. has a vulnerability in it. Is that right? Uh, we, or just a weaker one, which is easier to crack. Oh, okay. For example. So, yeah, there's like a, a handshake it's supposed to do. And at one point in there, you can tell it which cipher you want it to use. But there was a vulnerability where it was, it was accepting that instruction at the wrong times, which meant that you, you know, an attacker could essentially tell it to to change it without you knowing. Ooh. Or uh, or tell it to, yes. And then, then it could crack, well, m perhaps crack more easily. Um the encryption by yeah perhaps by using a cipher which was weaker or by using one which had a known flaw in it or something huh has this been fixed uh yes 
Oh, okay, good. So it was found by uh, developer Mas- oh, gosh. Masashi Kikichu. Oh, cool. Kikuchi. Kikuchi. Sorry, Kikuchi. Who discovered the floor and published a detailed blog post about it, including how and why they discovered it. Goes back a long way as well. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah it's been into... But don't they all? Well, it's like don't don't sixteen audit, years. Yeah, don't audit your code for sixteen years and then suddenly start auditing. You're going to find these things, aren't you? Yeah, this you're going to have a bad time. But yeah, the, I think <laughs> the the way the the developer describes it was basically they sort of started trying to implement a reference implementation of the the spec and then compared that to how OpenSSL had done it and then noticed, oh wait a minute, uh, <laughs> they've done coming. this wrong. That's really good. That's quite a neat. Uh, way of Clever. identifying bugs by re-implementing their API and then discovering huh, yeah I like that potentially yeah. quite slow though yeah uh, clearly had some time on their hands but yeah. then 16 years isn't you know <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and counting Alan Solomon the man behind 90s antivirus software Dr. Solomon's has said that antivirus software no longer works he claims that the number of new malware definitions released every day is too high and therefore affecting the quality of the software. When he released his software, there would be months where no new malware appeared. Now, 10, 100... Oh, man, here, there we go. Now, 100,000 a day plus uh, new, uh, new malware samples are discovered. Wow. Um, That's is quite that, a lot. So, okay, right. So I remember ye olde, you know, sitting in my rocking chair, thinking back to the early days of PCs and viruses yes. when you know, we used to get a new version and there would be antivirus updates, but the machines weren't internet connected. So it wasn't like we'd get an update every day or anything like that. We, you know, we would get a floppy disk in the post periodically yeah. and it would all fit on that 1.4 meg floppy mm. disk. And then, yeah, it's kind of accelerated. Is that because... We're finding them. It, surely it's not. Surely it's just that there are more people out there who are proficient in hacking on stuff that is defined as malware, which mm, you know viruses, yeah. but you know any evil stuff that could be a keylogger or whatever. It's probably easier to catch them as well because you're always online mm. and easier um, to, for them to before, distribute it. Yeah, as well. exactly. And there are virus toolkits out there, so somebody can download <laughs> a virus making toolkit, put their name really? in. Really? Yeah. Yeah, wow. like, like sample Isn't source like code for viruses and things. Well, yeah, but it doesn't stop them doing all the damage. No. So, <laughs> um, I'd imagine those are somewhat easier to spot, though. You know, if if it's if it's well, using some kind of framework, it's going to be generating code that's possibly got signatures that are e- easier to recognise. So some of the decent antivirus would at least... Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, absolutely. They're the rubbish but, coders, um, though. Well. Yeah, there's always the good ones. That's the trouble. But yeah, so um, Dr. Solomon, Alan, has a good name, has um, done the sensible thing and switched to Linux. What Hooray. does that say? But yeah, the guy who like made a, a ton of money on, I assume, uh, on antivirus. <laughs> well, you know, made some money, I'm sure, on antivirus. Yeah, decided that that was you know enough. I, I, that or it's just a really good way of kind of cutting off your competition at the point where you sort of go. Oh, well, it's going down, it's going down. I can't hold this much longer. <laughs> and just blow everyone out of the water. Well, he sold the company, I think, back in the late 90s. Yeah, so yes, a long time He doesn't ago. have a oh, commercial right. interest in it anymore. Um, but yes, he says, there doesn't seem to be too much malware for Linux. I don't know why. Some people say it's because Linux's security is better. Some say it's because fewer people use it. I'm not really bothered. So, Fair enough. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. I... I think, you know, he's right. I and mean, we've talked about viruses before and, and the fact that, you know, I, I, looking at my laptop, I just realized I don't actually have any antivirus software on this I don't laptop. on this one. And no. I kind of think <laughs> sometimes whenever this subject comes up, I do worry a, bit, a little bit, a tiny bit. I have one on my work machine. Right. Because is that I Linux or is it? On Ubuntu. On Ubuntu. Yeah. But that's your corporate desktop that's yeah. deployed and yeah. they manage that for you. Yeah. So, you know, as long as you've got the little icon in the corner that says... As far as I know, there's an icon there. I don't know why. (laughs) He's never told me there's a virus. Three lines of Python behind that icon. (laughs) Yeah, I should get on to Anton about that. But he's never found any viruses for me. Well, it wouldn't, would it? (laughs) (laughs) But then I've never noticed a virus on this one either, so... Ah. I I don't know how I'd spot one, but I've never noticed one. (laughs) My uh, my mother in law phoned me up today and she was asking about. Um, she's told me she's worried about her desktop PC, 
because it's running Windows XP. Mm. And she says, I, I'm really worried about it because it keeps popping up and telling me I'm no longer protected. And I don't, I don't know what to do. And should I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm worried. Should I go and buy a new PC or upgrade it? Or, you know, it's quite old and crusty and, you know, and the computer, not my mother-in-law. And, uh, and just let's get that clear. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, um, and, you know, I just wonder what, you know, what does everyone else do in that situation? Is everyone just like, you know, upgrading, throwing their computers away or? It seems to be go to the computer shop, get sold something. Mm. Yeah, I've got that to look forward to. Yeah. You're, not, you're not going to uh, make a, a mum-in-law bun to then? No. <laughs> 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 right, glad we can hear that. It rolls off the tongue less well. <laughs> okay, so phone manufacturer Meizu have spoken out about their development of Ubuntu for the phone, the MX3. Um, apparently, Ubuntu currently lacks certain hardware drivers required for the phone to be ready con- for consumers. Um, so the OS will be sort released it out, for. <laughs> what? He said, yeah. sort it out, Alan. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so the OS will be released for existing owners of the phone. Um, Presumably, so you can do it yourself. Well, that seems to be what they're saying. They're going to basically provide an installer for the phone, which might be able to, by the sound of it, do a full sort of replacement or a dual boot dual setup. Boot, yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we've got one of the guys. I think it was a kind of, you know, one of those Friday afternoon um, projects that a couple of the guys created the dual boot installer for Ubuntu. So you you can have an Android phone like a Nexus Four and dual boot between Ubuntu and an Android, um, and that seems quite popular. So people like that because you know they're the Ubuntu side is a bit cutting edge and maybe doesn't have all the applications that they need so they can flip back to Android when they get a bit scared or <laughs> when they when they need Spotify or whatever. Um, but um, it's interesting that this is a phone manufacturer who are kind of validating that as a process of, well, here's an image mm. and, you know, you can put it on your phone because it is your phone. And that way someone might write the moon uh, driver. Well, uh, yeah, I mean... I guess, yeah, there could be community contribution for people out there who ha- already have an MX3. But actually, I think because Canonical are talking to Maizu and have a deal with them of some kind, uh, I think that's being worked on anyway. Um, mm. So it's interesting because they make they make interesting phones that have stuff like dual SIM. So uh, that's you know interesting for some people who like the idea of having a you know personal SIM and a work SIM in the same yeah. phone and being able to switch between them and that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, that stuff's being worked on as well. Cool. Excellent. Well, um, I think that's all the news. Time no, for the time gaming, for the gaming news. news, Tony. We've still got five minutes. We've got a hell. bunch of gaming news going on. Uh, I think we're just about out of time. No, we're right? not. No, no, we're not. We, we're oh. looking at the clock as we speak, and others. There's stop filibustering, Tony, and speak. Left. Can't see the clock. I don't. Know I can. <laughs> <laughs> right, so okay. tell us about the gaming news. Um, uh, there is some gaming news, apparently. Um, so, yeah, you guys will already be familiar with all this. But yeah. um, with more than double the crowdfunding target requested, Superhot, a game initially made in a seven-day jam, the best kind of jam, is coming to Linux and inferior platforms like Windows and OS X. Um, <laughs> the game features an interesting new dynamic where time only moves when you do. So while it's a first-person viewpoint game, you're able to dodge bullets, sort of like in the Matrix. Yes, it's really cool. I, I tried it out. It's on it's on Kickstarter, as you know, mm. and uh, I, I downloaded. They've got a Linux version. They're, they've got a version you can play in their Unity web player. And I thought, oh no, I can't, no, the web player isn't available for Linux. And then um, I, uh, I, light, light. I I scrolled. No, I scrolled down a little bit, and it says, "Looking for a Linux build? Click here." There's a little zip file. You download it, and you've got a local build. So, do you have to at the moment? Do you have to contribute to the Kickstarter to get. The, to download the game, no, uh, not well, not to get the trial that, that oh, okay. I had to play with, right? But yeah, they uh, they've got, I think they're 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 asking for a hundred thousand dollars, and they got two hundred and twelve so far, two hundred twelve thousand uh, dollars so far, and they've got <laughs> okay. At the at the time of recording, there's only um, a couple of days left to go, right? Um, but um, yeah, it's it's quite an interesting concept for a game, yeah. and quite good fun, and. Uh, yeah, thanks for your input on that, Alan. I, I don't think really Sorry, I didn't mean to usurp Tony Gaming News. Didn't really add much, did it, really? Um, <laughs> Steam has wow. hit the big 500 for Linux games. So 500 Linux games on Steam is yeah. the other way wow, of looking at that. quite a lot. That's, uh, what, how big's the How big's the whole Steam catalogue? Oh, it's big. Yeah. Big, yeah. yeah the, I, I don't was, know, actually. It's lots. It's yeah. thousands. 
I was just going to say that myself. Yeah, sorry, Tony. Just, just keep jumping in, don't you? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and including um, uh, in the sort of Steam-related news, um, Civ 5 is now available on Linux through Steam OS, thankfully. That's yeah. Sid Meier's Civilization. And it's, and it's on special yeah, offer at the moment. It's £11 something for the full kit and all the DLC and all the extras and stuff. All the game alone is just a few quid. It's yeah, you, but you want the DLC, cheap. don't you? You do, yeah, for all the additional yeah, yeah. levels or whatever you call them, Tony. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, I, I call them levels. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and if, yeah, if, you're not, if you're not familiar with, uh, with the, the series, you can also get free Civ to sort of play around with the content. It's all right. I never really got the hang of civilization type games myself, but uh, yeah. I, what about you, Tony? Have you ever played Civilization, Tony? I uh, never stop. All right, I thought so. I'm playing it right. I, now. Uh, I actually, um, there's a, a couple of guys I chat to on uh, on on Mumble, and one of them said uh, when he saw the Civilization was available, he said, uh, "I think I might have to get that." And, and in another conversation, he was talking about writing apps for Ubuntu Touch. And then today, when I spoke to him, he said, uh, "Bad news! I bought Civilization Five, and it's completely halted any development I've done of any apps for Ubuntu <laughs> Touch <laughs> because it's just consumed three hours of my morning. Woke up at six o'clock and then just started playing straight away. So um, yeah, it seems like it's quite a good game. So mm-hmm. yeah. mm, excellent. Uh, any more gaming news, Tony? No, that's a lot, I'm afraid. Okay, I think that's the end of the news. The Ubuntu Podcast needs you. Yes, you." If you hear something that tickles, titillates, or taunts you, tweet us at UUPC or email podcast at ubuntu-uk.org. You can also talk to us on the telephone, Skype, Facebook, and Google+. Find links to all these places on our website, podcast.ubuntu-uk.org. We really would like to hear from you, so go on, do your duty, keep calm, and compose an email. And now for some community news. Um, and events. And, <laughs> and events. Mark woke up. Um, yeah, so it's currently, I think, Ubuntu... Open oh, thing. Yeah. What's it called? Online Summit. That's the one. UOS. Yes. It's got less of a, a ring than UDS. UDS. Yeah, it does. Yeah, I think we need to work on that. It's been yesterday, as at the time of recording, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So we're in the middle of it now. Um, and yeah, it's a bunch of sessions like he, like the online UDS that we've done before. Yeah, um, where we have sessions for planning, forward planning, and and also uh, some of them that are kind of announcements of um, you know letting people know what the plans already are that have already been decided, um, and progress reports and updates and stuff. So there was a session today where they were talking about the convergence plans and um, the Unity Eight desktop and things. Uh, there was a Q and A session about uh, Mir and Unity 8 and uh, and all that kind of good stuff. And all of it's done via Hangouts on Air, so they're all archived on YouTube. So you can go back and watch cool. them later, hmm. which is quite cool. So has anything particular been announced this time? No, there haven't been like big announcements or anything. I think that's that's one of the things that we've lost with not having UDS. It used to be that at UDS it was like a developer summit, and then it turned into... A developer summit and there were product announcements and big reveals at the start and mark would do a um like a keynote speech and mm. he would announce the the plan forward and stuff and we've kind of lost that as we've gone back to having just like planning meetings developer meetings q a sessions and all that kind of stuff which yeah. i think is a good thing really because we get back it's to actually doing doing, <laughs> doing doing work, work rather than <laughs> yes. bothering about you know great grand announcements and stuff yeah mm, interesting Interesting. Uh, the community donations funding report for the 2013 to 14 financial year has been published, and there's lots of money left over. <laughs> Maybe they should give it to us. No, the FF, the one that funded all those um, mentorship projects, and then ran out of money. Oh, oh no, no yeah. foundation. Yeah, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, this is the money that, that comes from um, the community budget, which. Uh, in part, I think, comes from um, the Mark? donation button. No, the donation mm. thing on the website. When you when you download an ISO and you get a little slider mm. and it used to give you a little skull when you chose zero. <laughs> it's a bit harsh. <laughs> yeah. There was like a it's like little sliders for how much do you want to give to the community, how much do you want to give to um I don't know, infrastructure or mm. something and Alan's and could, expenses fund. Exactly. And you could slide them all up and down. And as you slid them up and down, I mean it's it's still there now. If you go to Ubuntu.com slash download mm. and you hit the download button, you move these sliders and down the bottom it gives you a fun little 
uh, icon and a description of what that money could buy you. You know, so it's like a cup of coffee in Starbucks or a a, a t shirt or something. Tesla. Usually a little pe- <laughs> yeah, you'd have to slide them all across <laughs> and then probably add a few more and then slide <laughs> those across as well. But yeah, it gives you little ideas. But if you slide it all down, it used to give you a little skull, which yeah, was removed. <laughs> and now it's just a little sad face, man. That's sad. But some people do donate. And mm. uh, some of that money goes to the community budget. And yeah, uh, I think Mark Hall published the um, the uh, accounts, basically, of where the money went. It's nice to have that sort of transparency around those donations yeah, to, so that people who do donate can see where they go mm. yeah i mean people have been asking for it for a while and it was one of those things that that uh nobody quite got around to doing um and then eventually you know we just beat someone up and got them to do it <laughs> um but it's it's interesting to see where the money goes and see that uh, what kind of things people are asking for like mm. you know flights to go to conferences and um phones yeah, people asking for hardware for uh, doing development, or if they're doing a trade show or something, and they want they want to have handsets that they can demo Ubuntu Touch on or oh, something yeah. like that. People have put in requests for that kind of stuff, and I think that there is a link in the post that tells you how you can uh, how you can request funds for you know whatever your activities are. Um, and yeah, it was I, I just found it interesting to see you know uh, people being uh, sent to various places like Academy and you know, Deb Comp or whatever, and yeah, it's quite That's nice. Cool. Excellent. What's up next? Juju is now available on GitHub. Ooh. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> Juju G- is G- the... Cloud services? Yeah, cloud orchestration. Ooh. Yeah, if you'd said orchestration, you'd have won the prize. Yeah, I don't like oh, that word. Oh, okay. So well, does, does it work with Docker? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough about Juju. Prob- <laughs> or probably, Docker. or Docker. <laughs> well, clearly, yeah. We should probably get George on to talk about Juju for an hour. Um, at we some have point. talked to him in yeah, previous we, yeah. seasons yeah. about it. I'm sure it's moved on a bit. Yes, I think it, ha- it is actually ra- under rapid development. And one of the things they've done that this is mentioning is, um, yeah, move the development to GitHub rather than Launchpad and Bazaar. Interesting. Ooh. Is that mm-hmm. is that a general trend among a strategic direction sort of Ubuntu components these days? Uh, not that I've seen. <laughs> not, I've not seen anything else move uh, to GitHub. Obviously, you know, third parties can move stuff in yeah. and out of Bazaar and GitHub. But this is the first thing that I've seen that is canonical moving something. Kind of mm. makes sense because then you'll get other com- like every- GitHub's flavor of the month. So if you get other companies and things writing jujus. So, yeah, well, I think it's more to do with, like, the development of Juju itself rather than developing the charms. I mean, that would be oh, great right, okay. yeah, if you develop the charms, which are, like, the packages that you deploy with, with Juju. I think it's more getting contribution to the Juju code base itself. And I, I think, yes, if it's on GitHub, then probably chances are it's going to be easier for people to fork mm-hmm. than if you say hey we've got this new cloud orchestration thing and it's on launchpad what's that you know yeah. <laughs> using bizarre, bizarre. What's, what's that, that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah so you know you never know it, i it would be nice to think that um moving over to github would um accelerate the community contributions to juju yeah. but then you know what happens if it does if it, if you know if community contribution really accelerates then that makes you question well what about all the other things that that we mm. do that are open source free software do we start moving those off to github or some other you know bitbucket or whatever mm. it also um you know there, there's often a lot of controversy around the um contributor license agreement yes um which presumably people would need to sign if they were to have a pull request merged into the juju repository i guess so yes i guess but so. whereas github does make it quite easy for you to fork and develop on a fork mm-hmm. um, sort of in public on github mm-hmm. yeah so it'd be well in- yeah but you could do that on on launchpad as well there's nothing stopping you bizarre branching something and then pushing apart from to your no own. one uses bizarre. well no i mean th- no, <laughs> no. I, I, I'm, you were t- specifically talking about the cla and the cla yes, doesn't yes. stop you doing that okay no okay fair point uh, but you know yes you, I, I, I take your point. Yes. Cool. And following our interview with Marte developer Martin Wimpress, did I say that right? Yes. yes. It is Martin, yes. Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Wimpress. Yes. Yeah, thanks. He sees the possibility of an Ubuntu Marte remix, which is in the works. From the pre- preliminary screenshots, it uses Marte as the default desktop with the default Ubuntu theme, colours and background. Ooh. Yes. 
This Did is you exciting. have anything to do with this, Alan? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I said knowingly. Yeah. So after the last, after we interviewed Martin, I, I had a bit of a play with Martin. I was like, yeah, this is quite good, actually. So um, I had a play with uh, creating an ISO image of Ubuntu 1404, which had Mate instead of Unity, and that mm-hmm. worked. So I could boot 1404 from a live CD and then install it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that was quite good fun. Um, but Mate is not in the 14.04 default repository, but it is in 14.10. So I thought, ah, what I could do is make a 14.10 version and have it all come from the repository and not have to add any, you know, third-party PPAs or rely on any PPAs at all. It could all come from the repository like like all the official flavors do, like Kubuntu does, like Lubuntu and Zubuntu do. All of their packages come from the repository. I thought that would be nice. Mm. Got chatting to Martin. And yeah, we formed a plan. He registered a domain, oh, wow. which, which is the start of every the first project. Step to success, <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and he made a logo, which he's very proud of. But uh, yeah, we need a new one. <laughs> 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 if you go to ubuntu uh you'll see it. It's you know, it's quite nice. It gets the message across. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it was really, it's, it was Aww. really good. You know, uh, working on that with Martin. I think he's going to kind of take over um uh that project and uh, and work on that but we're trying to make it so that it it fits with the way all the other flavors are made mm-hmm. so that it, it's built in the same way so that you know if someone wanted to maintain it or carry on working on it they could work on it in the same way they work on any ubuntu flavor that's the idea cool excellent and we have an event to tell you about and when i say we i mean mark <laughs> and of course the event is og camp yay, yay. it's happening this year again Hooray. yay <laughs> In Oxford. In Oxford. Oh, I in see what you've done October. there. In October. Yeah, the 4th the fourth to the 5th of October. Um, that's October. Uh, at the Oxford Hotel in Oxford in England. Awesome. Um, so those of you who haven't heard about Odd Camp before, it's a free culture on conference, which runs across the weekend, um, where people talk about open source software and open hardware and creative commons music and literature and political activism and all sorts of other stuff really. banking, banking hacking yeah and all kinds of stuff yeah um you can go to ogcamp.org to find out more information and get tickets tickets are free Got but... one. <laughs> um but you can also pay us some money if you want all proceeds go towards making the event happen um, because we're all volunteers and we don't make any money from it. Um, there's also information about accommodation and travel and stuff. Uh, it's at a hotel, but there's also other hotels nearby and other options. Um, yes, good stuff. Uh, if you want to, if you want to help out, um, as I say, we're all volunteers. So if you feel like being a volunteer and you've got a bit of time um, and you want to help make sure Old Camp happens and is awesome, uh, then get in touch with us um, and. I'm sure we can find you something to do. Um, also, if you want to be on the crew for actually helping people out on the day, showing people around, making sure Sorry. that you know phones don't go off during talks uh, and things like that, uh, <laughs> then it's, uh, you can contact Les Pounder. Uh, he's Big Les P on Twitter. Um, oh, and we're also looking for sponsors. So if you are a company who likes advertising to a bunch of geeks, um, then get in touch and we'll tell you more about how you can sponsor OGCAMP. That's OGCAMP.org. Uh, That's all for episode 11. We'll be back next week when we'll be discussing the shutdown of Ubuntu One and alternatives and all kinds of other things, your feedback, and anything else that comes up. A command I love, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Cake? Yes. Is there more cake? I don't know. Oh. We'll have to see if there's some next week, yeah. won't we? Tune in, find out. If you're listening live, don't go anywhere. Um, there'll be another live episode along in a minute. See you next week. Bye! Bye.